Sorry about that. Hello. I'm so glad we could make it happen. <laughs> um, well, uh, Ali, I will pass it on to you to um, do the ho uh, housekeeping. Hey, guys, just a quick note on our, um, on our lateness. Uh, thanks for everyone who's been hanging out in the waiting room while we uh, sort out some technical difficulties on our end. Um, so I welcome you to webinar number five. And today's topic is uh, what makes a good life lessons from the longest study on happiness. Uh, today's session is hosted by the lovely Dr. Angela Lim. And joining her for today's session is the beautiful Mr. Robert Waldinger. Thank you for joining us today, sir. It's a pleasure. There. All um, right, so Ali um, does have a bit of technical difficulty, so I might start off. Um, the housekeeping side of things, um, you'll see in the chat that um, uh, you won't be, uh, we won't see your video, we won't see uh, your audio, um, so you can uh, feel relaxed and just uh, add your questions on the chat um, as you have them. And, um, and I'll kick off with the introduction. Thank you and welcome to Clear Heads uh, monthly webinar. And this month's uh, uh, webinar is extremely exciting because it's with Professor um, Robert Wildinger, who is a psychiatrist, a psychoanalyst, and a Zen priest. And he is the professor of um, psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and has directed the Harvard study of Auckland development which is the longest running study on adult life ever done. This study tracks the lives of two groups of men for over 84 years. And, it, and these are now follows the, the baby boomers children and understands how childhood experiences reaches across decades to affect the health and well-being of these people. Uh, he also directs the Lifespan Research Foundation, which is dedicated to helping people use their, this piece of research to improve their lives. And today is one of those ways in which he in which he's doing this. So with 22 million views, his TED Talk is one of the most viewed talk of all time. And it's an incredible privilege to have you here uh, talking to us. And um, so welcome, Robert. <laughs> Great to be here. Happy to be here. Amazing. Well, um, to kick us off, maybe, Bob, tell us a little bit about what got you started um, in this piece of research. Well, I was always interested in people's lives. Actually, when I was at university, I studied history because I was really interested in why people did what they did and looked at various times in history and how people behaved. And then in medical school, my predecessor in this longitudinal study um, lectured to my medical school class about these men and their lives. And it seemed like the most interesting research I could imagine. And so when he was looking for a successor, um, he thought that I would be someone who had the interest and the skills in terms of research methods to be able to do this. So he invited me out to lunch one day and said, how would you like to inherit this study? And that's how it happened. And as they say, the rest is history, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So tell me, um, you know, and share um, what were the you know most important lessons that you learned in the study so far? As you said, it's been going on for more than eighty years, so I'm sure there's been a lot of research data. What have you learned that's one of the most important? Well, hmm. two big things. One will not surprise you or anyone here at this webinar. It's that taking care of our health really, really matters that what we found, as many studies have found, is that uh, getting regular exercise, uh, not smoking, not abusing alcohol or drugs, um, getting regular health care, that those things matter tremendously in terms of how long we live and how long we stay free of disability. So that's all. Uh, those are all things that your grandmother might have told you in terms of, you know, eating your vegetables and getting enough sleep and playing outside. But the thing that we were surprised by was our finding that the quality of people's relationships with one another made a huge difference in their longevity and in their physical health, not just in their happiness, that the people who had better relationships weren't just happier 
as they went through their lives, they stayed healthier longer and they lived longer. That's a be very um, beautiful insight. Um, not counterintuitive in some ways, if you think that as um, humans, we've really evolved to be uh, social creatures and collaboratively um, survive the dangers that exist because we were not the strongest, biggest um, animals out there in the big bad world. So tell me, you mentioned about the quality of relationship. Would you, how would you define that? Well, there are many ways to define it, but really what we know is that the warmth of relationships matters, that feeling that other people respect you, care about you matters, that those who are in difficult, acrimonious relationships filled with conflict, those people have a more difficult time with their health as well as their well-being. Um, so it could be a friendly relationship at work. It could be the person you chat with in the grocery store every week. It could be, or it could be your partner who you live with. Um, so there are all kinds of relationships of varying depths and intensities, but that relationships that are more respectful um, have more of a sense of support in them are relationships that set up reactions in the body that promote health. So you talked about basically um, a high quality relationship as one where you feel respected and supported. And you also talked about how when the relationship is acrimonious or difficult or full of toxicity, um, that that you know, leads to the opposite um, situation. So how would you advise you know, our listeners that um, are in those toxic situations to turn those, can, is it possible to turn those relationships into supportive relationships or is it better to kind of just say, um, let's cut my losses and let me leave this relationship because it's doing more harm than good. Yeah. Well, of course it depends. Uh, it, it, all, each relationship is different and each of us is different. So if you're in a relationship where someone is making you feel afraid, where someone is violent, that's a relationship to get out of if you can. So that's at one extreme. Um, on the other hand, there are relation, every relationship has conflict in it. Every relationship has disagreements. And so you don't want to walk away from a relationship just because you've had an argument or just because you don't see eye to eye on everything. That would make it impossible to have any relationships. And so really it's a matter of discerning which relationships have enough of value in them that it's worth working out the disagreements. It's worth working out the difficulties. And then which relationships are so toxic that you need to walk away. And so there is no set formula that I can give you. Each relationship requires discernment. That may mean talking to others, getting advice about what to do. Um, it, it certainly, it means trying to talk with the other person and seeing whether you can iron out some of the difficulties that you're having. Yeah, that sounds really good. Because I was going to ask you, how do you know if this is a good quality um, relationship or not? Um, you know, because most people don't have the, the ability to discern this. And so uh, it's good to know well, that actually it's that... Each of us needs to discern it. We are always, yeah. I mean, you, it's hard, right? And so I think what you're saying is it's, this is not an easy thing, but each of us has to make these choices. We make it every day, right? That's which right. Which relationship to engage in and which not. That's right. Yeah, and I think what you, what you suggested, which is something that everyone can do, is that, you know, speak to someone else, you know, get that third party person to review whether this is a, a healthy relationship or not. And, and I think we're not always very good at listening, but I think, um, you know, triangulating, because um, there are obviously um, sometimes, you know, uh, people who uh, might have uh, beliefs outside of us um, that uh, don't necessarily foster uh, 
good objective advice. So, you know, making sure you ask a few other people um, uh, and their perspective to triangulate um, your decision. And so, when you know, I remember when I was growing up that what mattered was just how many friends I had on whatever social media I was on. Um, when I was younger, it was Bebo, so that showed my age. Um, and then obviously that's now, you know, trans that's like Facebook, it's Instagram, etc. So I think that in a world where um, appearances really um, matter, um, people think that it's the quantity of connections, but you're really talking it's about the quality. So how do you, did the research sort of differentiate between quality versus quantity of social connections? Well, you're raising two things. One is quantity versus quality. The other, I think, is online versus in person. And one of the things we know is that having, you know, 500 friends on Instagram is not a social life. And that, in fact, real friendships are friendships usually that can get translated into in-person uh, contact. And so the people who do the best are the people who use social media, for example, to develop relationships that then they take into the real world. And, and, and other people simply say, well, I've got 500 friends on TikTok, so it doesn't matter. Or I've got all these followers on social media, the, that's all I need. That turns out not to be true for most of us. Uh, so that's one aspect of what you are asking about, Angela. The other is the question of do, do more contacts mean I'm happier? Do more contacts keep me healthier? And that again depends on who we are as people. So we're all arrayed on a spectrum. Some of us are introverts, we're shy, uh, we don't like parties, we don't like being around a lot of people. Some of us are extroverts and we love people. So depending on who you are on that spectrum, it may be really good for you to have a lot of connections and a lot of friends because you're an extrovert and you get energy from people. If you're an introvert, it may be that you only want one or two really close people and that otherwise it's a stressor to have more people in your life. That's not unhealthy. That's just fine. It just is a matter of personal temperament and preference. So again, it's finding out who, who each of us is and what we need and what helps us thrive uh, that's important here. Yeah, and I think that's really the essence of mental health and well-being is that there is no silver bullet, there is no one size fits all. It's actually taking a step back and reflect, you know, who am I as a person? What do I want? How many connections fulfill me? Maybe it's just one. I just have like this one best friend that I message all the time, I have dinner with all the time, and that fulfills my life. And some of us, it's like, I need a group of girls that I could hang out with and go on weekend trips all the time. And we have yeah. to, you know, a group of 10. And so we can have a big party. And and it's all, only you know what that is, but you have to take the time to reflect that. And same thing with your relationships, you know, being able to kind of say, you know, yes, I have 500 connections, but if I ask myself this question that I'm in trouble tomorrow, can I count on any of these 500 Instagram friends? Um, will any of them come to my aid? Am I meeting them in person? If the answer is no, then you've got to take a step back and say, you know, are these really the connections that you have in your life? And if not, you, sh you know, what can you do to build it? So maybe let's transition to that next question. Because I know as I get older, it's become harder and harder to make new social connections and partly because it's people live very busy lives and you know they're right. prioritizing their kids they're prioritizing their elderly parent they're prioritizing work um how, how do you advise people making to how do you advise people to make new social connections especially quality ones right not just like i've added another instagram friend usually the best connections are made through frequent repeated contact that's why like the coffee machine at work is often a very important place you know because people 
run into each other. They gather there. They might, and not just once, but over and over again. And one of the things we know is that people often start to develop friendships through these informal contacts that happen again and again. It's one reason why connecting with people around shared interests is a way to start making friends. So, you know, if you decide you, you know, you love to play football and so you join a football league or you love to garden, so you join a gardening club, this is where you can come together with people who love something that you love and you share an interest and you start by doing this activity together and gradually some of those relationships become friendships. People meet volunteering for political campaigns, um, for so many things. So what I would say is find what you love to do and find ways to connect with other people around that interest. Because then you'll be doing something you enjoy, so you'll actually be at your best, and you'll be with other people who share an interest with you automatically. Yeah, that is so true. And if you, you know, some of us will maybe think back about the friends that we hung out with in high school, you know, would we sort of hang out with the same people again? Probably not, because we've evolved as people. But, you know, what probably happened was, you know, the people you hung out with in school were the people that maybe lived in your local neighborhood, um, when you were constantly on the same school bus system. And as to your point, it's that frequency that breeds familiarity. And I think in our head, we think that, oh, it means, you know, ticking all these boxes of like how they're the same as me. And actually, no, it's just regular positive interactions that builds the foundation of a good quality relationship. And as to your other point, which is making sure you you are out there doing things that you love. Um, so I guess an advice to anyone who's feeling lonely right now or who feels like they've just moved to a new city or a new job and you don't know anyone, um, just start with, again, coming back to yourself and saying, like, what, what do I love? You know, I actually really love reading books, you know, so hanging out at a bookstore and then and then actually uh, making yourself vulnerable and, and 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 sort of say like, you know, you start, you start the conversation, say hi to that person that you've seen, you know, three times and at the gym and and you kind of and, and maybe give a compliment and people love receiving compliments and and then and then the next time, you know, maybe offer to buy them a drink and and then suddenly you're building, like you said, that in like those small frequent uh, interactions that help build the foundation of a relationship and mm -hmm. I sort of I sort of talked about sort of people feeling lonely um, what we see in our data is that loneliness is on the rise um, obviously perpetuated um, by the pandemic and these uh, quarantine and lockdown orders that we're now lifting but people have developed a level of uh, comfort of just being at home but then at the same time being at home means you're not out there connecting with people in the real world and building those social connections what are you seeing in the research around loneliness and and, and what to do about managing that yeah well loneliness was on the rise before the pandemic uh long before and it's been increasing uh, so that you know in 2018 i think the UK appointed a minister of loneliness uh, because it was such an important social problem. Um, and so COVID has exacerbated everything, has made everything worse, but it's very much a part of modern society. Um, and so the solutions to loneliness, people are working very hard at, but it's very difficult to to figure out a solution. Again, one size never fits everyone. Uh, so some people need to learn better social skills. And actually we're trying to teach children about you know, how to make friends, how to keep friends. That's really important. Some adults can actually use help with social skills as well. Some people are socially isolated. They're geographically isolated as we have been in COVID. And so again, for them, it's joining groups that may help them ease that isolation. And you can even during COVID join a walking club or a running club or join something where you're outside um, doing something that won't expose you to the virus, but 
can help you connect with other people. Um, so it really varies. Uh, older people have a lot of trouble with social isolation because our social networks can sometimes shrink as we get older. And there again, uh, being part of organizations that help older people connect with one another is an important way to remedy that. But all of it involves each of us reaching out to other people to try to make uh, a difference in this problem of loneliness. Some of us have the uh, outgoing qualities that allow us to reach out to others. Some of us are too shy. So those of us who are more outgoing should do our best to reach out to the people who are shy. Yeah, that's right. And I think what you're really saying is that it's really important um, in order to maintain a relationship uh, is to have those uh, regular moments where you're rechecking in with people and especially if you are someone who is more comfortable doing that um, I know that there's this narrative that you might say oh that other person should reach out to me you know why, why am I always the person reaching out and just recognize that um, you might have a little bit of that resentment but once you reach out and that person um, connects back then you know all of that initial resentment should hopefully pass, and then you build on that foundation um, that you're really very much uh, meet, both needing, <laughs> whether it's the person reaching out or the person who's being reached out to. Um, so maybe you know you talked about so needing children to learn about how to build these social connections. What are the common challenges that you see? that stop people from building these social connections, especially these high quality ones? Well, sometimes it's literally social isolation. So if people are working at a job that's very solitary, you know, um, someone who's like a night security guard who doesn't see anybody. I mean, these are literally problems because people, you could spend your whole day, your whole work life, not seeing anybody. And then you go home alone. Um, some people um, are in situations where their health is not good. So they have trouble going out of the house. Again, they probably need people to come reach out to them. So there are a variety of situations that create social isolation and loneliness. And then, as we've said, there are um, times where there are people who don't know how to um, how to make social connections. Certainly that people on the autism spectrum um, have a lot of difficulty with that, but they can learn. And there's, there's a lot of good uh, work now helping people on the autism spectrum learn how to make good connections. Um, so again, it's first looking at what the source of isolation is and then seeing where there might be a remedy for that. You know, you talked to, you know, you talked about children learning. You talked about those um, who are on the autism spectrum who make who find it harder to make friends and social connections. Are there just sort of like three tips that you have on? Here's what you can do to start building those social connections. Yeah, I mean, one one would be to. Uh, work on the social connections you already have. So relationships don't just take care of themselves. You, you may think, oh, though, if somebody's my friend, they're always going to be my friend. But it turns out that's not the case. That in fact, many times friendships just kind of wither away and die. Not because anybody's angry or uh, wanting to pull away, but just because we neglect our relationships. So one of the things you can do today, one of the things you can do this weekend is stop and think, okay, do I, I have a free Saturday afternoon? Do I want to spend it doing my email? Do I want to spend it on social media? Or do I want to spend it reaching out to a friend and asking someone to take a hike or have a coffee, right? So it, it involves being intentional and more proactive. That's one tip. Um, another tip would be to 
again, try to find a place to do an activity that you love with other people. So that would be the second thing. And that's where you might find new people. Um, and then another might be to reach out to someone you've been angry at or someone you've had uh, a feud with or a rupture with because you had a disagreement. Reach out to them and say, hey, I'd love to talk and just see what happens because often when we can heal those disagreements, first of all, it takes a lot less energy than holding a grudge and it can turn out to be a very important positive relationship once a, once a disagreement can be worked through and repaired. Bob, those are three really great suggestions. And to all our listeners, I really challenge you to do that. I challenge you um, after listening to this, take a piece of paper and write on that piece of paper one, a name that you want to reach out to that a friend you haven't connected with, a family member you haven't connected with, but have always been meaning to, write that name down and then just send a simple text message saying, hey, just thinking of you, let me know if you're free to catch up um, sometime. That's the first challenge. The second is, okay, take the time to think about, are you doing things that fill your cup? And maybe it's going for a walk um, or a hike. Maybe it's going rock climbing. Um, so yeah, second thing on your piece of paper should be, this one thing that you're going to do, um, whether it's to start it or do more of it. And then the third is exactly that. Um, who is one person you've had a bit of a disagreement with and be the person to reach out and, and put that olive branch because I'm sure all of us has at least one. So, um, and, and, and yeah, we'd love to hear, you know, how you go. So um, make sure you maybe um, message us on, uh, on at Clear Hits, our social channel and Share with us if you've got any really cool results that came out of our challenge for you today. Um, that's uh, that's so practical, Bob. Like I feel that often we 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 think about the fact that we feel lonely and disconnected and unhappy, and we think that it all feels like there's no way we would get out of this feeling. And what you're saying is like, look, you just need to take one simple step, um, and and it will kind of. Uh, lead to to um the next step which leads to the next steps and then now you have the foundation of what's really good um you know we talked about um here and there around sort of social connections that work um but maybe do you want to dive a little bit deeper on on that area like you know what as a workplace um who is um, most organizations are now fostered with this situation around hybrid um, or remote working, where it's very hard to build positive culture. It's very hard to, like you said, have that water cooler moment because those are spontaneous and unplanned. So how do you, you know, do you have any research or advice um, for people leaders who are trying to foster positive connections and culture at work in the context of hybrid and remote working? Mm. Well, everyone's trying to answer that question for sure, um, because it is such a problem now for all of us. And there, you know, there are a variety of solutions. Uh, none of them is perfect. Sometimes teams will get together, um, you know, once a week or twice a week. Uh, even if they're working remotely, they'll make sure to come together at a certain point safely if they can, you know or people will um, socialize. They'll deliberately reach out and socialize with workmates and, and they'll organize this at work so that people can, can make those more spontaneous personal connections with workmates. Because one of the things we know is that having a personal friend at work makes you much more engaged in your work. It makes you more likely to stay in your job it makes you happier and, and it makes you a more productive worker. So uh, leaders in workplaces are trying to figure out ways to foster more personal work connections because what they're realizing is that it actually affects the bottom line in a good way, that, that better work happens if people are more personally connected. 
Yeah, I uh, have heard those um, big consulting firms, uh, they throw all these really epic parties um, and sort of almost nudge you to, to build a lot of your uh, social connections with your work colleagues. And therefore, when suddenly you are thinking about leaving, it is harder because you're not just leaving a job, you're leaving pretty much your whole social support network because it was either work and socializing with work colleagues. So, you know, there, there, you, it's also, we want to encourage um, broadening out your social circles, um, but absolutely it's so beneficial to have someone who understands what you're going through because you might have a really great partner, but if they don't understand the, your work constraints and the idiosyncrasy of that, having someone you can vent to and then feel better yeah. and then move on, it's, it's so important, right? Um, uh, look, Bob, I know that you're writing this new book called The Good Life. You know, is there any nuggets that is coming out in that book that we haven't talked about already? Well, there's a lot in that book. <laughs> so the book is, is, um, is a deep dive into relationships uh, at home uh, with romantic partners, with family, with friends, at work. So there are a lot of different aspects. And what we do is we tell stories from the study. So we disguise the identities of the people, but they're real people and we tell their life stories. We weave them through the book. Um, and I think some of what we come down to is the idea that these relationships can be built and tended to, that it is possible. And that even if you're feeling kind of hopeless, like I'm not very good at relationships, that that can change because we, we tell life stories in the book about people who thought they weren't very good at relationships and gradually they found that they had warm, happy connections with other people and their lives were transformed. So we follow people over time in the book and tell some very hopeful stories about how people found their way to better connections with others. I love that you're doing that. I mean, ultimately, as humans, that's how we learn best. We, we learn best by telling stories. And, and yeah. we tell stories to others, but we also tell stories to ourselves. Like, what's the narrative that you're saying in your brain right now? You know, do you tell yourself, oh, I'm terrible at making friends? And therefore, you assume that um, you will always be terrible at making friends. But actually, as humans, all we need is a positive feedback loop. So there have been so many practical tips on how to start that first introduction or maintain an existing relationship. And then you'll find that if you do that simple thing and then it works, it's that positive feedback loop. And then you can tell yourself, oh, actually, maybe I'm not that bad at making friends or maybe I'm not that bad at maintaining my friendships um, and my social connections. So, um, but what we're, we're also saying is it takes work. You know, these, these relationships, whether it's romantic or, or familial, uh, or just a friendship, uh, it, they they don't um, stay protected in a bubble. If you don't nurture them like a house plant, the house plant will eventually die if you don't water it, you don't put it in sunlight, and you just leave it in a corner in the dark. Uh, these relationships are exactly like that as well. Right. Um, yeah, that sounds really good. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share before we maybe move into... Um, questions from the uh from our listeners um just that i think that that it's important to remember that relationships do not have to be smooth to be good relationships i just want to reiterate that that it can sound like well if you're doing it right your relationships are all going to be happy and you're never going to argue and that's just not true that there's, there are arguments, there are conflicts in every relationship, that's not a problem. As long as there's a kind of bedrock of affection and respect, and that that's what you wanna look for in and build in good relationships. So basically you're saying to me, if there are like regular challenges in my relationship that's affecting my mental health at times, because you know, we, we are generally creatures that avoid conflict. That's one of the most common ways in which we deal with life. Um, how do I know, you know, how do I know when, when it's, a, it's an opportunity for growth versus, and, and I should stay in the relationship and work through these ups and downs that you've talked about versus when do I know like, okay, let's, I'm done. You know, I've, I've given my all and I really should cut my losses. Yeah. Well, I think the 
there's a, a simple question, do we still care about each other? And is there enough that's good here that it's worth working on in this relationship? Yeah, that's such a that's such a simple question. And it's not just asked by one person. Um, it should be asked by both parties. You know, it's it's um it takes two to tango basically. And I mean I can share like running a startup is is incredibly hard. Uh, it might seem glamorous, but I can promise you it's incredibly hard. Um, and there were ta- there was a period in our in our startup where me and my co-founder Michael, um, you know, things were not going well, at, and and we were just disagreeing on how we would solve the problem. And it was it was incredibly like the probably one of the hardest thing I had to to navigate through. And but what I did do is I asked myself, do I care about this person? Absolutely. And I said to him, look, you know, work aside, um, you're my friend first. And so, so, you know, kind of demonstrating I care and then also looking for signs that he cares back and also being able to ask that. And then the second is then making an effort to kind of um, extend that olive branch. So when I would go on trips, I know he loves pies and I would see like, oh, there's this super cool pie and I'd bring it back when I um, and it's like, hey, I brought you some pies. And, and you know, it's um, and, and that means that, you know, again, it's that I respect you. Yes, we're going through a tough time right now. We're disagreeing on a lot of how we should run the startup, but I still care. And we're both committed to working towards this because we both care about what the mission of the startup is, which is to improve access to good mental health support. Um, so I think that's the most important thing is to take a step back and say, do you still care about this person and, and being in this relationship? If, you, if the answer is a yes to you, then actually have that conversation with that other person and, and whether they're in the same position. Do they still care and do they still want to work at the relationship? Right. Um, and if not, then, hey, you know, I think you've got to say, are you better off just investing the time and building a new relationship where both parties are committed to it? Um, that sounds really good. Um, I know that um, uh, there are sort of um, other questions. Uh, and sort of another question might be, you know, what do you do when you deal with someone with you know, sort of narcissistic tendencies who, um, and you're trying to live by your values? I mean, we talk a lot about today that this is a piece around self-reflection, you know, you really understanding what you need for yourself and then creating that environment um, that you want to live by. So, yeah, I, and I've been in relationships with narcissistic people. It, it can be a bit of a... Yeah, I, I won't swear on the, on, on the podcast, so I will pass that to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, narcissism is, uh, there's healthy narcissism, which is really just healthy self-regard. But what we often talk about when we say someone is narcissistic is we say that they, they don't have a good way to regulate their self-esteem. And so they have to build themselves up and often uh, drag other people down. Uh, And they're very self-absorbed because they're so worried about whether they're okay. And they need constant reassurance that they're okay. Some of our prominent political leaders suffer from this particular disorder. And so what do you do when you're uh, in a relationship with somebody who, who is that way? Well, one thing that can help is to be sure the person knows that you think they're just fine. Um, that, um, you know, that, that what, what you're really looking at often is a person who's unsure of himself or herself and needs to be reassured. And so sometimes reassurance can go some distance to helping the person calm down and to help the person pay more attention to the world around them, including you. One of the difficulties with people who have narcissistic tendencies is that they don't, it's as though they don't see us. They don't see the rest of us. They're so self-absorbed that they can't think about how things are affecting others. And so often it means trying to help someone focus on the outside world, including you, the other person in the relationship, and seeing what's possible with that person. Some people are so impaired that they really can't 
uh, have a mutual relationship with another human being, but other people can, can come some distance and get better at mutuality in relationships. So again, it's trying to see what's possible with a particular person. Yeah, you know, I, I talked about sort of having been in relationships with others who uh, have narcissistic tendencies. And, and actually, one of the ways in which I practiced compassion was actually understanding where they were coming from. And what I knew from that person was that they were bullied when they were growing up. And exactly as you said, that insecurity that came from that trauma meant that they were trying to protect themselves by now over projecting that they're amazing over projecting and actually so we have this assumption that people who are narcissistic are just um, incredibly confident and and actually in some ways it's probably the opposite it's there, there's an overcompensation and they're they're needing to tell themselves this narrative that i'm amazing as a protective buffer because they're dealing with the the whole or the insecurity that they are facing um so talking about sort of, you know, being bullied when, when someone's growing up, for example, I'm a clinician, you're a clinician, we've heard of this term adverse childhood experience as a, or ACE as a way of really affecting people's mental health and happiness, you know. How do you define happiness to people? <laughs> I'm, I'm throwing you the big one, define happiness. And, um, and, and what's your thoughts on really sort of what we call adverse childhood events and or, or traumatic childhood um, experiences that prevents people from from reaching that happiness okay yeah well that's a big one so happiness i think of happiness as a fleeting emotion it's a moment-to-moment -moment experience and so really i mean nobody's happy all the time it's just impossible life just doesn't work that way so we move in and out of happy mood states and more subdued mood states, sad mood states, you know, all of us. Um, and so and that's important to state because we can end up feeling that if we're not happy, it's because we're doing something wrong. And that's not the truth. If we're not happy, it may just be that right now we're not happy and that an hour from now we'll be happier. Um, I tend to think more about well being, this idea that you can build ongoing well-being a sense of life being okay even when times are hard and that's often through good relationships through a sense of purpose in your life there are a variety of ways you can build well-being that's different from moment to moment happiness and then of course that question about childhood experience is really important we've studied that a lot in our research and we found that the majority of the people we study have some adverse childhood experiences, uh, have ACEs, these, these adverse childhood events that have been defined, and actually there are 10 of them in this questionnaire that's widely used. And there are many more besides the ones in the ACEs questionnaire. What we do know is that those adverse experiences have a significant effect on all of us as we get older. Many of us can grow into greater well being, greater uh, happiness um, as we have more positive experiences. So, there are what we think of as corrective experiences where, you know, I may have had an abusive relationship where people bullied me when I was a kid, but now I've made friendships where I trust my friends and nobody bullies me. And I can realize that that was a very particular time when i was a kid it was a bad time and that i don't have to expect bullying from relationships now that's a kind of correction that happens through life experience and there are many such corrections that can happen um, but some people end up without meaning to recreating the same difficult experiences they had in childhood by accidentally getting themselves into more abusive relationships as adults and when that happens it's often possible to learn from those experiences sometimes through therapy where we can see the patterns of choosing partners who are going to be abusive and starting to shift away from repeating those patterns so 
Adverse childhood experiences are very complicated. They're very important, but they don't mean that that's our destiny. We're not doomed to having the same adverse experiences all the way through life just because we had a difficult childhood. Yeah, absolutely. I, I One of the mm-hmm. things that I, I'm a big fan of was what I call post-traumatic growth. And that is that if you are able to recognize that you have experienced adversity, whether that's currently or in the past, um, is to your point, it doesn't have to define you. It doesn't mean that just because something happened in the past, it will happen again and again. Um, that uh, we're lo- making sure that we're not looking for those negative confirmation bias where we're trying to, you know, oh, we've been bullied. Oh, that's another bullying experience. And then we're seeking them out rather than maybe seeking the opposite. It's like, what are the moments when people are really helpful to us and finding moments for gratitude? Um, and 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 if you find that you can't do that self-work yourself, as Bob, you've mentioned, being able to say, look, I, I, I don't want my life to be destroyed and I don't want to kind of set myself up for failure. Um, I'm going to ask for some professional help. I'm going to go see someone who can um, help me unpack the patterns of my life and then help me figure out what are the behaviors that I'm doing that perpetuate these patterns. So, um, and, and I think what we're really saying is that um, just because something bad happened in the past uh, doesn't mean that it's not possible to, um, to rise above it and and that uh, you have had many stories in this long study that show that that is possible and to have hope that it is possible. It will take time, it will take work, but it is possible. Um, and do you sort of um, uh, feel that um, with when sort of these relationships involve children, um, how do you, you know, do you do anything different, I think, when, when those relationships you're part of involves children, for example? Those difficult relationships? Is yes, that what right. you're asking about, yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, like, you know, when we, we sort of, like you mentioned, you know, you might get yourselves into these negative relationships and then maybe... Uh, over time, you realize that actually I am in this negative relationship that I've maybe uh, found myself in, and but unfortunately now children is involved because they might be it might be a toxic uh, romantic partner. Yeah. Do you do anything different in those situations when it's not just you being involved? Well, I think you're responsible for more than yourself in that situation, right? You're responsible for a child or more than one child, and that means that you have to be more careful and and take greater precautions to protect children it's one thing for an adult to be in abusive in an abusive relationship it's another thing for a child to be subjected to that kind of abuse that the scars are deeper and last longer when this happens in childhood so we really need once we bring children in the world or have responsibilities for children we need to be much more careful about making sure that um, we don't stay in relationships where children are being abused. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And, some, and it's hard. It's hard to make change, but it's important to do. Um, maybe just to kind of finish off the questions, um, you talk about happiness being fleeting. It's a moment-to-moment thing. Um, should someone chase happiness, I guess, like as in should they be doing things to keep, you know, uh, creating these moments of happiness, for example, um, I don't know, seeking uh, uh, goals and achievements as a way of finding, uh, you know, I've achieved this goal, I feel a sense of achievement and and happiness. And and, yeah. (laughs) Well, again, one size does not fit all. When they study varieties of happiness, uh, some people are most fulfilled when they have happy times in the moment. So going to a great party tonight is the, is the best thing I could do if I'm that kind of person. For someone else, it's having a long-term goal and that's meaningful to me. And I really want to achieve that goal. And I'm willing to sacrifice a lot because that goal is something I care about. And that's most important to me in terms of making me feel like my life is happy and fulfilled. For other people, it's having interesting, challenging experiences new travel, uh, people who are very different from myself, all kinds of things. Um, So it depends on what lights you up. 
And I would say that each of us is different, that all of those things I just mentioned may sound somewhat attractive, but we all prefer one of those flavors to another. And so it's a, a bit about finding out who you are and what's most engaging for you. And I think that really is the moral of the story in today's session, which is very much around, yes, we talked about social connections, which we think about as external to us, but actually it all keeps coming back down to you, the individual, what do you need? And, um, you know, whether it's how many connections you need, what type of connections you need, how do you find the type of happiness that you want? It all comes down to self-work. And if you can't do it yourself, then ask for help. There are mental health professionals that can get you there. Um, just to maybe close it off, um, do you have any final words to share about um, social connections and, and what, you, what you can call the more consistent well-being and, and potentially resilience against the adversity of life um, to close off the session. Any parting words from that side? Probably just that social connections are, are, as far as we know, the best investment you can make in your own well-being and your own happiness. So if you're going to invest in one thing more than others, it's probably your relationships that will have the biggest payoff. And with that, um, thank you so much, Bob. It's been an incredible pleasure. I've, I've gotten a sense of happiness if, if you haven't seen it from um, how joyful it is to be able to talk to you and, and just the expertise you bring to the topic and how approachable you've made the content. It is totally possible. We've given you very clear tips. Um, I'm going to remind you listeners about the three challenges that I, I sort of uh, brought um, brought up to you about and and you know really would love to hear how each and every one of you um, apply this in your life well thank you so much again bob and we wish everyone a very lovely day it was a pleasure angela bye bye <laughs>